and cousin, welcome to Coco Conjure. Here we talk about all things hoodoo, folklore, and spiritual journeys. My goal is to give foundation to the novice and inspiration to the advanced practitioner. If you have not guessed already, my name is Coco. Um, to all 10 people who gave me a solid five-star review on Apple Podcasts, thank you. Thank you so much for all the new people that have subscribed or followed on various platforms. I see you, cousin. I see you out there. And baby, you looking real good today. Don't hurt him while you stunt. You better do your strut. <laughs> all right. Let me let me tell you guys about signs. Um, I'm not one to find signs in everything and anything around me. Like, I don't look for angel numbers. I'm not, you know, gazing at the sky all the time. So when I get signs, they got to smack me dead in the face. (laughs) And I feel like signs uh, should be very obvious and very specific. So cousin, as I was preparing for the October folklore episode, I kept coming across graveyard stories. I wasn't looking for them. Every time I would open a book, Um, or go through my notes, first thing that pops up is a graveyard story. And as I was pulling questions for the folklore episode, uh, graveyard work kept coming up. (laughs) Again, not looking for them. I would just scroll through some that I collected or hit the boards and boom, graveyard work. And as soon as I logged onto YouTube to catch up on my watch list, the first three recommended videos had something to do with ghost stories and graveyards. And at first I thought to myself, well, you know, we in spooky season. The algorithm is going to push you, you know, some good witchy shit. (laughs) You know, then, um, then I felt something hit me and I looked down and it was my cat. I have a black cat named Grace Jones. Um, and she's headbutting me for attention, but she also didn't want me to touch her. You know how cats are. Um, so she's staring at me. I'm staring at her. And as we are gazing into each other's eyes, I realize, um, paperback books don't have algorithms. (laughs) And, uh, the date of me writing this episode is mid September. Um, and you know, it's not spooky season yet. (laughs) So. So I said to Grace, I said, Grace, I think I got to do an episode about graveyards. And as she is a cat, she just meowed at me and then sat on my feet and uh, she hasn't moved since. So, you know, sign scene, graveyards it is. (laughs) To get us into the graveyard, I thought I'd tell you all a story um, as as I am tend to do. Um, this story comes from Harry Hyatt's Hoodoo Conjuration and Witchcraft, Volume 1. A lot of times when I reference Hyatt uh, on this podcast, I'm talking about traditional work because he went from, you know, state to state um, where the black folks were and asked if they wouldn't mind divulging some of their spiritual practices and got them talking. And then, he, you know, he wrote down word for word um as they spoke, no matter how convoluted they sounded, (laughs) Uh, he wrote down word for word what they said. Um, But this time it's, we're going to talk some folklore Uh, at the beginning of that tome, his collection are actual folklore stories. Um, And it's something that I skip over sometimes uh, when doing research for this podcast, but um, it's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff there. So (laughs) Uh, this this time, Hyatt's informant is a white guy from Maryland who had at least eight stories about this black conjure woman named Aunt Zippy. Um, take a listen and let's take note of all the work that Aunt Zippy did. This was, I imagine, about 65 or 70 years ago, before 1936. This lady was a relative, a great aunt of mine. She was living in Wacomico County at a little country place by the name of um, Salome, Maryland. She was going with a young man living in the same neighborhood and they were engaged to be married. 
there was another girl that this same gentleman was mm, had been going with, which, of course, you know, I can't call his name, but he was going with these two girls and they were very much in love with this one particular man. Now, in order to get advantage over the engaged girl, her her name was Miss B. The other girl, uh, we'll call her lady number two. She tried to find some way to get rid of Miss B. And in doing so, the only way she knew how would be to fix some way to put a spell on her. You know, she had lady friends, of course, that was stopping with Miss B and also with her. So she got one of these ladies to secure a lock of Miss B's hair. And in doing that, Miss B, of course, you know, didn't know that they were securing a lock of her hair. It ran on like that for a little while and she was taken sick. In other words, it was um, it was more like her mind. Miss me, Miss B's mind got to be very, very bad, very bad. Uh, she consulted doctors frequently, but nobody could seem to do her any good. Really, she gradually grew worse and worse in her condition. Of course, of course, the gentleman friend that she had wasn't paying her much attention to her, you know, with her being sick. He figured that, you know, that wouldn't be the kind of woman for him. He was paying more attention to the other young lady, lady number two. But in doing that, you know, Miss B tried around different physicians and nothing worked. Finally, she couldn't get any relief. So she went to see the old colored lady by the name of Zippy Toll. Zippy was known for several counties as being this great fortune teller. She could remove spells as well as call them on, you know, from different people. Uh, she could put them on someone else, too, if necessary. She consulted Zippy Tall, and in doing that, she, that's um, Zippy, told her her troubles, told her what was causing these troubles, I mean. She said, Zippy, she said, well, can I get cured? And Zippy said, yeah, I can cure you. I can also put his name, I can also put the same thing on the one that put it on you, you know. And she said, she said, no, I don't want you to do that. I would just love to get well. If I can get well, I'll feel that that would be the biggest thing in my life. All right, Zippy said, all right, I can tell you how to get well. This is what you do. Zippy told her, if you go to the graveyard, your family graveyard, beside your brother's that's uh, now dead there you'll find a lock of your hair buried in the ground with a brick on top of it there you'll find a cord wrapped around a lock of your hair and just as long as that lock of hair stays there this work will gradually you know do work on you there'll finally be there, there you'll find a cord which binds that hair perfectly tight now when you go to the grave don't go until this hour is over OK, you got to go to the grave between the hour of 12 and one o'clock at night there. You know, the other lady's spirits won't be there and uh, and your spirits, you know, they'll protect you. You go there at that time. There you dig in the ground at a certain spot next to your brother's grave. You'll find this brick and under there you'll look and you'll find a lock of your hair. Just as I told you. All right. Now you bring that to me. Now, don't you go around telling anybody you found it. Don't tell anybody that I told you the way to find it. You just bring it back to good old Zippy, and I'll tell you what to do with it. <laughs> now, of course, Miss B, like most people, she felt that anything she could do, you know, to bring her health back, she was just rejoicing in that fact. You know, she would do it. But she waited until the next morning and she went back to Aunt Zippy Toll. That's what they called her. They called her Aunt Zippy. And when she got there, Aunt Zippy said to her, she said, well, you found just what you're looking for. And Miss B said, yeah, I found it. It was right there. And Aunt Zippy said, well, you say that's your hair, right? That's a lock of your hair. And Miss B said, well, it's the same color and it looks like the same hair. And Aunt Zippy said, and how did you find it? And Miss B said, I found it with a little piece of cord wrapped around the hair. And Aunt Zippy, Aunt Zippy tells her, she goes, and that cord around the hair, it must be causing you all this trouble. Your headaches and your pains. And just as long as that string, that cord was wrapped around that hair, you will never gotten any better. You ain't going to get no better. You will have gradually gotten worse. Now, if you want, I can put the same spell back on the other person which of course 
you know who it is. But first, you have to remove that strength. And on Zippy, she said, you take this hair and you destroy it by burning it up. But don't let anybody ever have any of your hair because this same woman will be trying to do the same thing again. I know. So Miss B, after doing this, she gradually got better. She got well, made a strong, healthy woman. Right. And lived to be quite old in age. I, I would be positive to say she was around 70 or 75 years old when she died. This was the age of, no, no, no. She was like 23 or 24 years old when that woman first put a spell on her. And she died at like 70 or 75. Now, naturally, I know it from actual knowledge. Okay. It had been handed down right in the family. And we knew this to be a positive fact. This is not a hearsay or somebody telling you about it. It's really positive. It's absolutely true. The woman had practically gone crazy and lost her mind. The woman just pulled that hair right out of her head. But her life, you know, it would have been blank. She went on through her life, though. I, I, you know, I don't know if lady number two ever did get married. I don't know whether that would be necessary now in this particular case or not. But I know this thing was is that was that was put on that woman. Whatever was put on that woman was taken off by Aunt Zippy, who in those days, you know, she was looked upon as a great witchcraft and fortune teller. All right, cousin, let's break it down. <laughs> so Miss B and lady number two, they were in a love triangle. Lady number two got a lock of Miss B's hair. And let's be honest. <laughs> let's be honest for a second. You and I both know she took that hair to Aunt Zippy. Because, <laughs> you know, Aunt Zippy could curse and cure, right? And she knew exactly where that hair was and what it looked like and what was going on with it. I mean, she knew exactly what was going on. Now, sure, you can say, you know, that um, she was a fortune teller and, you know, Aunt Zippy was really good at her her craft, really good at her practice. But I'd like to remind you that ethics and hoodoo is a new thought. <laughs> Just Nowadays, people won't lay a jinx or a curse or at least not so loudly. But back then, you know, back then, if a worker was going to make money, the money was found in doing the darker stuff, at least, you know. That's how Buzzard and Sheriff J.E. McTeer used to tell it. <laughs> so to help out lady number two, Aunt Zippy probably got Miss B's hair, tied it tight with a string, laid it in the graveyard near Miss B's ken, and buried it under a brick. <laughs> this was done to drive Miss B crazy. So crazy that the dude would, you know, he would skedaddle skedaddle with lady number two. Um, I've read some crazy stuff. Nowadays, we probably go to the graveyard or a crossroads with a name paper and a bent nail and nail the person down. You know, uh, the bent nail causes confusion. The crossroads of the graveyard will have their spirit restless and trapped up. At least that's how it was explained to me. Um, you could also use crab claws, which, you know, I'm in Maryland. So crab, cl <laughs> crab claws are easy to come, <laughs> come by. Um, child. I had one good weekend with some friends and a dozen crabs and two beers later, I had some conjuring materials. <laughs> so you, you, you could use crab claws, uh, crabs because they walk so crazy. Um, they can cause your enemy to move in a very confused, funky manner. Like they're spiritually funky. And you know, as they move about, Oh child, but I digress. Okay. Another thing I found interesting in this story was the fix for the curse, right? So aunt Zippy sent Miss B to the graveyard to dig up the hair that she put there, but she had to go between 12 and one. She couldn't go before 12. She couldn't leave after one. She had to go between 12 and one. Now I cannot be sure if aunt Zippy was working the same way, but 12 is a good hour and one is a bad hour according to Zorno Hurston and her mentors in new Orleans. So Going at 12 and leaving at 1 seems to me to be symbolic of a liminal time and space. Like the spirits of the graveyard are having a shift change or something. <laughs> you know. Sometimes sometimes people ask if timing is important in hoodoo. And I always say you do work when work needs to be done. 
But also I say that timing is important when it needs to be important. <laughs> so so if you're working with a renowned worker like on Zippy, especially since on Zippy was probably the person to put the curse in the first place, then you go when the worker tells you to go and you don't fudge it around. You don't try to work around it. You don't try to make it, you know, amenable to your timeline. You do what the worker says, right? Um, same with the string on Zippy was very clear that if Miss B wanted to lift the curse and get her mind back, she first had to remove the string and then burn everything up. So, um, basically it's an undo. It's how do you counter work? You either do work that works opposite of what the person did to you, or you undo their work you find physical evidence which um isn't necessarily as easy to do in our life because we're not as uh close to others right but if you are you find physical evidence of what was done and then you mess it up you destroy it you burn it up you remove it from its place that kind of thing um also because Aunt Zippy was so adamant about this string being the cause of the problem that leads me to believe that the string was worked over and played a heavy symbolic role in the work. Um, you know, hoodoos tend to think that not work or working with string is a very European witch thing, and it's not. It's just it just isn't black folks from all over the world have been using string to heal and harm, mostly to heal. If I'm being honest, um, you can find pictures of people with intricate knots tied over their body to get rid of like actual diseases um, or strings tied around their head or on certain parts of their body to get rid of aches and pains. So like that's not abnormal. <laughs> it just isn't abnormal. Um, I We just don't necessarily hear it used in this way all the time. But it makes sense if you want to tie someone up, then you use string, right? Um, so, you know, we might not work with string like a European witch. We might not be doing not magic, but it is a tool we use nonetheless. Yeah. So yeah, that was solid work on Zippy. We see what you did there. Um, you know, I think the only thing missing from Aunt Zippy's instructions, and again, this is being told by the great great nephew of the person who you know it originally happened to <laughs> so he might not have all the pieces but um the one thing I think is missing from Aunt Zippy's work or instructions um that we as modern hoodoos would take into consideration is graveyard protocol for example um some folks leave coins or offerings at the gates of the graveyard or the cemetery when they plan on doing work there. It's usually a number of pennies, like three, five, seven, nine. Um, and they pay again when they leave. Again, that's uh, protocol being followed through, depending on where you come from, depending on how you work, depending on... Um, you know, if you had a mentor who showed you how to do it a certain way, that kind of thing. Um, I've always seen, I've always seen that interaction, the paying at the gate as an acknowledgement that this isn't just a visit to go see grandma, <laughs> right? It's payment to visit the more spiritual nature of the graveyard itself. Like you are paying a toll to the spirit of the graveyard itself, uh, or, you know, to the spirit of death that reigns over it, or you're paying a toll to the collective nature spirits or guardians who live and protect that site. Regardless, it's a toll to be paid. So, what I mean is, is if I'm going to the graveyard for a walk because they've got, you know, a two mile walking path and I need to lose another 40 pounds, I'm not paying coins at the gate. <laughs> right. Because I'm just going for a walk. I'm just enjoying the scenery and I'm going to get out. Right now, if I'm going to the to the graveyard or to the cemetery to um, to do work there, to commune with the spirits there, then, yes, I'm paying a toll. Uh, because I'm, I'm entering a different aspect of this site. I'm, I'm seeking to, um, visit the more spiritual aspects of this place as it were. Um, of course there's also protocol for what you wear to the graveyard. I personally just make sure, 
Uh, three things, three things have to be in place. I make sure that my head is covered. I make sure my shoes are closed toe and I make sure I have on a protection talisman. Okay. Now that's whether or not I pay a toll, (laughs) whether or not I pay a toll. If I'm going to the graveyard, my head is covered. My shoes are closed toe and I have on um, a protection talisman. Uh, That's no different from when I do work with large pagan groups or I go to the festivals and things like that. Um, It's to me, that's the same protocol whenever I'm in a space spiritually uh, where I know that something can follow me out or I'm not sure what's going on there I always have on something on my head close toe shoes and um, a protection talisman of some sort now um, some folks also wear all white or wear something that they feel is like ritual wear you know Um, but I'll your girl is way too simple for all that. <laughs> I'm way too simple. As long as my head and my toes are covered, as long as I have my hand, I'm good. <laughs> um, what are some other cocoa rules that I take into consideration? Okay, another cocoa rule, which I think this is like generally across most hoodoo workers, but I can't be sure. Um, I never touch the grave of a person that I don't know. And I never take from a grave of a person that I don't know. So I don't know, say I want to do some justice work and I found a judge that was buried in this graveyard and I want to take some dirt from his grave for the justice work. Um, I would visit that grave first a few times before I would even think to take from it. (laughs) I'd offer whiskey because all spirits like whiskey or I would offer flowers I'd read up on that person I get a feel for them I would also try to figure out how they died because okay cousin listen um a little bit of Coco's cosmology (laughs) I believe that the earth remembers I cannot tell you for sure if there's an afterlife I do not worry about whether there's an afterlife I do believe full heartedly that when we pass our body is returned to the ground and anything that we held in held um onto in life is also returned to the earth okay so whatever that person took with them the moment they passed is now seeped into the grave around them <laughs> right um and i feel like if they die peacefully that's safer to work with um, I don't know if that's just my UPG. I don't know if that's a hoodoo thing. I'm telling you that that's what I believe. And um, I would ask you to examine your beliefs around uh, death and graveyards in that manner as well. And um, yeah, so I also, <laughs> getting back to topic, I also, when I visit the grave, before I take anything, uh, I also take divination tools. Um not like a full set of tarot cards. Um, but I do take like yes, no divination tools. I personally enjoy using mercury dimes for yes, no work. Um, but you could use a pendulum if you want, you can use dousing rides. I don't know, but you want, um, a divination tool of sorts. And because you're going to ask, Hey, now that we've, I've shown you who I am. I know a little bit about who you are. Is it okay for me to take this dirt? (laughs) And, uh, I, although I do have a knowing deep in my gut, I am not someone who hears, smells, sees, can touch, taste spirits. Like that's not a talent of mine. Um, so if I can't feel the knowing, I need a divination tool (laughs) to tell me what the answer was. (laughs) Right. So there, there's that. Um, same thing with guardian spirits. So guardian spirits of a cemetery or a graveyard, the trees, the trees, the plants, they are earthbound spirits that are um, taking in, surrounded by the whatever was returned to the earth in that place. OK, so um, trees that are lining the edges of a graveyard or a tree that's smack in the middle of a graveyard. These are guardian spirits of that place. So um, if I don't want to work with a particular grave, and instead I just want to work with the spirit 
of the graveyard itself, I pour some fresh filtered water at the base of one of those trees. And I may sit and read aloud or enjoy the shade, you know, spend some time with that tree, spend some time in that place. Then ask if I can take a little dirt and, you know, I'll throw my dimes for an answer. If I get three heads or more is a yes, three tails or more is a no. If you get two Teds and two tails, then don't do anything because it's a little shaky. You might got to go do some more work there or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, guardian spirits. And I got to be honest, a lot of times when I go to the graveyard, I don't worry as much about the graves of the people themselves than I do about the guardian spirits there. Um, but that has a lot more to do with my uh my cosmology my spiritual beliefs and a little less to do with hoodoo yeah um but yeah trees trees are important (laughs) um the last protocol thing I follow is to dust off before I get to the car (laughs) I carry a small broom or a besom and just like brush myself down from head to foot and I take a cleansing shower when I get home. Again, I'm not sure if that's a hoodoo thing or a cocoa thing, <laughs> but yeah, I don't want to take anything home with me. Like I don't um I don't want to take anything home with me that I didn't ask to come with me. <laughs> right? Um child cousin story time one time I was at this botanica and I ran into uh two other black practitioners there it's my it's my my favorite botanica in Baltimore um they have everything that a folk magic practitioner no matter their tradition can find like they can have everything there um so I I ran into these two other black practitioners one woman had some alekes uh with the tag still on it from when she bought it at the shop in New Orleans (laughs) and the other guy was a self-professed spirit magnet okay like he was self-professed spirit magnet um he explained to this woman uh that he had just come from a funeral from three states away and that a spirit had attached itself to his immense spiritual aura and y'all he was (laughs) he was proud of the fact that this happened to him like he was he wasn't telling a story he was bragging that this happened to him so you know I grabbed my beeswax pillar candle and some charcoal discs and I hot footed it to the register because <laughs> and totally away from that guy because what what are you talking about sir like y'all the shopkeep was like did you did he say what I heard him say and I was like why you think I'm over here with you because <laughs> anyone proud that they're being chased by spirits from a graveyard three states away is not all right in my book (laughs) you ain't right in my book man at all (laughs) child I don't Ugh, ugh. he left himself open in a space um that is can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing so it's weird it was a weird flex (laughs) okay so you you know how to move about the the graveyard you know what to do before you leave you know what to do when you go in (laughs) what is what do you use graveyard dirt for so um okay so we saw in the story that you leave things there sometimes (laughs) right you leave people there you leave things there and it can really f up their situation i'm telling you um if you're taking graveyard dirt home um For example, I might use it in my doom work. That's D-U-M-E or destruction upon my enemies. Or you might also hear it called death upon my enemies. Um, So a lot of times it's for uh, crossing people up is why you leave things in the graveyard. (laughs) That's that's usually why you do it. Um, Or you take dirt with you. An old coworker of mine uh, who she mentored me when I was starting my, my journey into uh, who do she says she used the dirt from her mother's grave in any work she was desperate to get done so we're talking money work love work um as a matter of fact she used it to get her house she did like a a house working um or a new home working and she sprinkled the dust like it was fairy dust <laughs> right her mother's graveyard dirt like it was fairy dust on the work and not even two or three days later things worked out for her and she was able to close on a home where before it looked like it was going to take another few months so you know it worked for her 
in that way. But I, I have to point out that the dirt that she collected was from an ancestor that died peacefully and loved her dearly. So I figured that has a lot more to do with ancestral ties um, than actual common uses for graveyard dirt or why you would go to a graveyard in the first place. You know, like I'm not personally sprinkling graveyard dirt like fairy dust. <laughs> um, the most common uses I've come across, though, are stuff like what Aunt Zippy did. You bury someone in the graveyard to cause them grief. Now, there are some works out there that you bury them in the graveyard or you use the graveyard to cause death. Um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff in Harry Hyatt's book. Uh, and normally at this point, I would give you like traditional workings <laughs> that I found. But I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> I am not going to tell you, you know, uh, how to do death work because no matter how gray my moral code is I will never promote death work on this podcast no matter if I think it works or not it does not matter I am telling you don't do that <laughs> there are other ways to solve your problems um than wishing death upon someone don't do that um <laughs> uh oh here is one that I can tell you an old school jinx is to mix graveyard dirt with sulfur and toss it in a person's path or on their front door <laughs> OK, that marks them for bad juju. Um, just make sure that if you decide to do that graveyard dirt and sulfur, uh, make sure you don't touch it. <laughs> you got to wear gloves or you end up marking yourself. And cousin, you don't want to mark yourself. <laughs> so um, just to recap, some folks have graveyard protocol that includes paying a toll, covering their head and feet, really getting to know the grave before you start conjuring up and talking to spirits you don't know. Like you should really get to know that spirit first. If you have a plan on taking something or doing work while at the graveyard, make sure that you bring some divination tools you're proficient in and something to do a quick uh, clearing before you leave. Um, while you are there, know what you came for and come to terms with the kind of work you want to do. Um, don't take anything from strangers, build up a relationship with the guardians or the spirits of a particular grave, and don't take anything until you are sure you got an okay to take it. <laughs> and probably the most important part that I haven't touched on yet. Um, if your spirit is spooked and all you're doing is standing at the front gate of the graveyard and you're like, this don't feel right, then you don't belong there. <laughs> you don't. If you scared to walk in, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> All right, we've reached that part in the podcast where I pick a question from the boards and I answer it. <laughs> um, I'm only going to do one today because this is already running kind of long. I've been trying to keep these podcasts between 30 and 45 minutes for season two. <laughs> for my sanity and maybe for your listening pleasure, I feel like a shorter, if I get it in that shorter time frame, it's always better off. Um, So I'm only going to do one question today. I'll save the other one for the folklore episode coming up next week. Uh, this question comes from Facebook. Um, It says, I told my husband, well, it's more of a, it's more of tea than a question. <laughs> Um, she said, I told my husband that I wanted a separation because we're just two completely different people because now he's found Christian Christianity and, um, I'm a spiritualist because I told him this, he's been threatening my life saying that somebody must die. If we leave each other, <laughs> we, <laughs> wow. I went to the station to file a complaint. Uh, there, but they said I had to call 911 first. I wrote a banishment protection petition, lit a black candle. The man went in and destroyed my altar, saying that my ancestors are demons and tried to harass me. I'm livid. Then he turned around and said that in order for me to live, or in order for me to leave, I need to sit down with a lawyer and sign a paper stating that I don't want child support from him. I am in disbelief behind all of this because everything is happening so fast. Uh, I know that he's got to go. Oh, child. And then, child. The reason that this one stuck out to me is because of the response. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can find the response. Here we go. The first response to this and the one that's... <laughs> More highly liked, it says, 
Wear all black and take his name to the graveyard at night and don't forget to cover your head. Leave appropriate offerings. Make sure you cleanse yourself before getting back in your car and again when you get home. <laughs> what? Everybody's like, and that part. Do that, girl. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> somebody was even like, what are the appropriate offerings asking for a friend? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that will uh drive him away or if that will kill him like if the aim is to kill him which we don't do that here um or if it's like miss uh like if it's on zippy toe and uh the point is to drive him crazy but um it's definitely doable i <laughs> to give him to the spirits um I mean, I guess that could work. My my first thought would not be graveyard work. Actually, even though I know this is the graveyard episode and I'm talking about not doing graveyard work. You could do that. You could take it to the um take his name or personal concern to the grave graveyard, leave it with the guardian spirit. Uh disrupt his spirit. But I think the problem is is that his spirit is already disrupted. So, um I don't think the aim of that is necessarily to the aim of that work is not necessarily to drive him away or to make him clear minded. It's just to cross him up. And if you have to deal with him, I, have you ever been around people who've been crossed up? <laughs> it's just not it's not helpful for what you need to do. Um, so my thought would be to do running foot you take his name down to a river and you throw him in the river and you get him as far away from you as possible. Um, that's not the full running foot working, but, um, that's the idea or hot foot. We, um, hot foot is the, is the one that we know more today, but running foot is the precursor to that. Um, where you literally get somebody as far away from you as possible. (laughs) You just push them right on out. That would be my way to go. Um, just because he sounds like he's not mentally well, um, based on what they described. He's destroying things in the house. He's um, threatening your life. Like, he's not mentally well. So I would get him as far away from you as possible. If you wanted to do graveyard work, then, yeah, you would um, take um, personal his personal concerns um, and some string and tie it up and you would leave it with a grave that you've adopted or that you know or you would leave it with a guardian spirit now I would make sure that you write a petition so that way you're saying exactly what it is you want done exactly what it is that you're asking to be done um so that way it's not left up to the spirits to decide what to do with this man because you might be responsible for something you don't want to be responsible for um, and again, I don't promote death work on this podcast. Not in that way. Not at all. No. Um, so <laughs> so um, definitely that. Yeah. And also um, appropriate offerings, water, whiskey, flowers, um, that kind of stuff, depending on the grave or if you're working with a guardian of the graveyard, that, that's definitely something you want to take with you uh, when you go. So, yeah. Good luck to that person. Um, I hope that they get out. <laughs> I hope that they get as far away from this crazy person as they can. I'm really sorry for them in their situation. Okay. Cousin, you made it to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for staying with me uh, this whole 30, almost 40 minutes. (laughs) I appreciate you. Um, Before we go, cousin, I want to let you know that you deserve the world. Okay. Um, the graveyard is a scary place sometimes especially if you're new and it doesn't have to be it can be a wonderful place like I said I will go for a high girl walk (laughs) and the local graveyard next to me um, and just enjoying the space enjoying the scenery enjoying the peace and quiet that's there Um, but doing work there can be very fulfilling it can be very helpful um, as long as your aim is true and as long as you follow your protocols you should be fine and just know that uh, whatever work you do there if you call for your blessings cousin they will in fact come to you i'll see you guys next time